I want to say a big welcome to Sonia Lally, who is our author this month. Uh, for those of you who read the book, are you Sarah? Mine has the little pink thing because I got to read it before everybody else did. <laughs> uh, thanks for being here, Sonia. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. So you are from Saskatchewan. I am. Tell yeah. us about your backstory. Um, well, I was born and raised in Saskatoon. I lived there until I was in my almost mid twenties. Um, I love it. I still go back all the time. Now that I have a 10 month old nephew, especially, I think I've like lived there basically. Um, yeah, my, my both sets of grandparents immigrated to Saskatoon in the mid 1960s and my family's been there ever since. And, uh, I still consider it home. So you're in Vancouver now. I am. Yeah. So what pulled you away from Saskatchewan to the bright big city of Vancouver? Um, well, I moved around a bit since then. I only moved to Vancouver um, a year and a half ago, and that was because we have lots of family here. Um, and during COVID, you know, having no one to bubble with uh, really sort of puts things in perspective that, you know, outside of um, I was we were living, my husband and I were living in Toronto at the time. And, um, you know, we loved our jobs. But after, after COVID happened, we just realized, you know, it was important to be closer to family. And because of his work, we needed to be in, in, a, in a larger city. So we couldn't move back to Saskatoon, unfortunately. But um, uh, yeah, it's it's been, um, I guess I left because I wanted to to, to, see, to see something new. I, I honestly thought I would return. So this has been a bit different. Yeah. So you are, correct me if I'm wrong, are you trained in law? I did. Yeah, I went to the U of S. So you have classic law training. How do you end up because this is not this is your first thriller, mm -hmm. not your first book. So how did you find your way from law into the world of creative writing? Um, well, I've always loved writing. Um, I've always been interested since I was a little kid and did creative writing classes in high school and, and like, you know, a huge reader. Um, but I it's not that my family didn't encourage me to go pursue writing, they always did, but they also definitely encouraged me to have another career, you know, something secure, a fallback plan. And so that was sort of my goal at first. Um, and so I, I trained in law and I really loved it, but, um, you know, I graduated quite when I was quite young and I felt like I had some exploring to do. So, um, you know, over the last, uh, you know, decade really I've been really doing um, quasi legal jobs that were more nine to five that um, sort of gave me space to sort of pursue writing at the same time so I was working um, as a in legal publishing and then in book sorry and in, in, uh, yeah for a legal publisher and then in trade publisher um, all the while pursuing sort of that very long grueling publishing process of trying to get an agent and then published and then and then keep writing books so for people who don't know like this is published as SC Lolly. Mm -hmm. But you are published as Sonia Lolly as well. Yes. Tell us about your first few books because they're quite different from this uh, this kind of story. Yeah. So my first, um, so I've written four other books. Um, they are all uh, romance or women's fiction or you know rom coms. The first one was The Matchmaker's List. The most recent one was A Holly Jolly the Volley, which came out you know this time last year around the volley, like a Christmas romance. And I think what always pulled me to writing initially, honestly, was writing women's stories, you know, writing about love and about complicated relationships, you know, female friendships and relationships with their mothers and our ex-boyfriends and all these sort of different dynamics that I find really compelling and are very universal, um, particularly with a South Asian lens, you know, so, you know, contemporary women like myself who are very Canadian, but also very South Asian in other ways and sort of how that um, mixes. Um, and then the whole thriller thing kind of came out of left field, honestly, um, in early 2020. I'd had this idea for Are You Sarah for years um, because I almost switched Ubers with someone once, you know, uh, at late. I mean, it wasn't almost. It was sort of it could have happened in, in, in a different scenario. And so I'd been sitting in this idea and I love I love writing, reading thrillers like, you know, Sherry Lapina, Ruth Ware, uh, you know, Jillian Flynn, all of them. And then, um, you know, when COVID happened and I was in my one bedroom apartment, um, you know, with lots of time on my hand, I just thought, you know, and I was, you know, in a very dark place, as was most of the world at that time. I thought this might be an interesting way to pass the time. And that's when I started writing Are You Sarah? And so um, I didn't know what would happen with it at the time. And I'm glad I didn't put myself in a box and just tried it because I turned out that 
you know, I loved it. And I found that I actually do have sort of a side of myself that's a lot darker and not focusing on like love, but focusing on death, apparently. (laughs) How did your publisher take the pitch after four very successful romance novels? Um, So my agent offered it to them. This was at an early stage. I'd sort of, I'd um, sort of written out a a proposal, like how it would all work. And, you know, they said, um, great. Uh, They they wanted to focus on my rom-coms, but they kind of gave me their blessing to sort of try and take it elsewhere. So, um, you know, this book is with a different publisher and then it's sort of a different name just to sort of keep those two sides of myself separate. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So you, you mentioned that if you almost got in, could have potentially found yourself in a different Uber. I'm guessing you probably didn't almost find yourself murdered. No. <laughs> where, did the, where did the where did that storyline come from for you? So it was different. Like I worked backwards for this one. So the whole hook, the premise of these two women switching Ubers, that came from, you know, being out late one night waiting for an Uber and, you know, seeing a woman across the road and seeing, you know, when our Ubers arrived at the same time, it was like the same make and model coincidentally. And I just sort of, you know, my creativity and imagination ran away with me. And I found myself thinking, you know, what would have happened if such places, but that was just sort of a premise, right? Like there's nothing really there. Uh, The idea about these, you know, for those of you who've read it um, about these two Sarahs, what their lives were like, um, you know, how complicated they were, uh, that came later. And it was sort of, um, I drew on um, other characters and situations that I'd sort of thought of before and and kind of pulled it into that to that initial premise. Did you pull some of your background and cultural influences into that as well? Was it and I have to ask when I say that, is there anyone in your family who ended up in this book unintentionally? Um probably not. I would say mostly <laughs> um a part maybe me a, a little bit, I guess. Um, so Sarah I mean, she's, I think she's quite a controversial character. I mean, I like her, but she does some really bad things and has some really bad motivations often. Um, But she is, um, she's kind of just does what she wants and she's not, and she hates this idea of being a good Indian girl. And that's something that I have always resented, sort of this label that, you know, these expectations around, um, you know, South Asian women that we are, you know, good girls and we listen to our parents, we get married right after college and then have three children and move into a house and all these things that sort of society expects of us. Um, I, I really resented it and I, and I pushed it all away. And I think a lot of my, um, a lot of myself and my own experiences and wanting to be different and wanting to be bad even sort of I, um, I harnessed on that to sort of create this Sarah character. And of course, I exaggerated a lot. <laughs> so I'm hopefully not <laughs> that much like Sarah. How did you come up with the bad guy? Um, well, I do watch popular television shows. I think <laughs> that I, I, I do find that um, those sort of, uh, I think I've seen a few seasons of Scandal and, and Suits and how, it, how to get away with murder and those sorts of very sort of high drama probably hopefully unrealistic um, legal situations and people. Um, I love, I love that kind of drama and action. Um, And then I also, um, you know, articled in Saskatoon and I mean, you know, not that I, anybody I worked with was like, was like Jason or like any of these people, but um, I, I do find it interesting of the power dynamics because, you know, when I articled, I was, um, 23 years old, I was a young woman working with a lot of, you know, older men. And I mean, I had um, overall a really great experience and great mentors, even if they were men and much older than me. And um, But I, I did hear of situations and found myself wondering, because there's a huge power dynamic when you're a young woman um, entering um, that sort of profession or any profession where you're in an office culture um, or in sort of um, the power imbalances are just there and it's um, and people deal with it in very different ways. So you said you worked backward for this one. How did you come up with the ending? Because that's the thing about right. the thriller, right? Is the big reveal mm-hmm. I find. Um, I remember and one of the first books we ever did with this book club was The Girl on the Train. And I yeah. remember I was reading it on holidays in Mexico and I remember like pinpointing the page being like, I think I figured it out. Mm-hmm. So working backwards, how did you come up with the ending for this one? Um, so we're spoiling, spoiling, you're spoiling. Okay. Yeah, you're... <laughs> yes. Okay. So 
You mean the the final ending, not yes. the okay. Um, the, com- the so completion. the the Sarah's ending of it. Yes. Um, I think that it was just about me wanting Sarah to subvert expectations, and so yes, she went through this whole journey. She did some really terrible things. She had a lot of remorse about it. She fixed it. I mean, she you know, um, bad guys were caught. Um, she, she got to a place where she could have easily taken that path where, okay, that was my past. I'm going to be a good person now. And I'm going to marry the nice Indian boy who is in love with me. And I'm going to go get a stable job and that will probably be fine. And my family, I'll be able to support my family and do all these things like I'm supposed to do, but that wasn't enough for her. Like she doesn't want to be a good Indian girl. She wants to be the best. She wants to be like Jason. She wants to be a little evil. And I think that it was just about her um, sort of being an anti-hero in that way that, you know, even though I, I think some people and I root, I root for Sarah. um, She, uh, she isn't all good. Do you think you have to be a little bit bad to be successful in her world? Um, I'm not, sh- I'm not sure about that. Like in that sort of fictional or sort of, um, I mean, this, this whole, uh, sin- these whole scenarios that I've created about, you know, these corrupt lawyers and these, these very high stake situations. I mean, except for, you know, what we read in the news and comes out, we really don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Right. But like, like most average people like us, we, we actually don't know the inner workings of like how how corrupt are people like it, it does this actually happen so um for her world in that world that sort of hopefully mostly fictional world I think you probably do have to be able to compromise your morals um especially when you are working as a lawyer you are a service provider for clients you are acting in their best interests and if they want things that aren't legal um that's your decision of whether you're willing to do that for them Interesting. I ask this fully watching a new Netflix series called Partner Track, where they do lots of awful oh. things to each other to get partner. Um, oh. so I'm looking forward to watching that. <laughs> it's so good. Um, so when you store, do you storyboard? Do you write in chunks? How does, how does your process come together if you're working backwards or forwards? Or how does your writing process work, particularly with thrillers? Um, well, I do it for both. Um, I, okay. I'm one of the people who outline, like they say, are you a plotter or a pantser? Um, I'm a plotter. I like to know where I'm going. Um, so when I started writing the book, I had, you know, I combined all my very, very messy notes and ideas and sort of developed an outline. I followed sort of the traditional three act structure, um, just, and, um, and went chapter by chapter and created a character arc for Sarah and for the other main characters. Um, and that's to say that although I planned a lot of it, definitely things change. I think you can't plan it so detailed that you you don't leave any room for yourself to be creative. Um, actually, in the very so in my outline for Sarah, um, so 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 it, like so Sarah's romantic situation in the book and the final draft was that um, you know after she goes and deals with Jason, she comes back to the university and um, she starts dating AJ. So in the original draft, she continued dating. Uh, she continued dating Tommy right up until sort of the climax of the reveal, and AJ was on the sidelines. But um, that, when as I wrote the thing, I realized that even though I'd outlined it that way, it didn't really make sense because Sarah has to sort of go back to AJ and 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 try on this idea of doing things the right way for her to really realize that she doesn't want it and reject it and go back to her initial mo. So are you like a post-it notes, write it out, drawn all over the place kind of outliner, or do you outline in a, like a word document? Um, well, I have a notebook always beside me just for like messy things that I can't control. And then I use um, this writing software called Scrivener, which is basically just, um, it combines text, um, text files in a way that you can really easily organize it. So like a digital notebook, like Evernote, but oh, neat. you pay for it, I guess. Um, so uh, I, I use that to sort of try to keep track of everything. I wanted to talk to you about the other Sarah, particularly mm-hmm. the obsession Sarah ends up with, with Sarah, the two Sarah things, a little confusing, but if you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and the obsession with like her online life, 
getting into her family, those conversations. Do you think that in the world we live in now that that is more common than people are comfortable believing? Because I think of how easy it is to just scroll on Instagram on someone I don't know, let alone someone that I have that kind of connection with. So I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you think about like influencers, a lot of us follow influencers and there's sometimes people just keep showing up on my feed and I find myself knowing exactly what their life is and where they're going. And, and I, it's not even like I want to be stalking this person. It's just, you know, they're sharing their whole life on the internet. And so I could, so, so I know everything or I know everything that, about them or, you know, that they let, that they reveal on social media. So I, I definitely think that's, that's the case. Um, Sure. I think we all do a little cyber stalking. I cyber stalk my neighbors because uh, I can't remember their names sometimes. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like we've all hit that one Instagram account that's private that we see people who we know that are following them and have access mm-hmm. and we would like access, but we don't want yeah. to admit we want access. Exactly. So we do the awkward like behind the wall thing. We're like, mm, I guess we just don't go to see. <laughs> exactly. So, um, writing are you Sarah versus writing the uh the other four books uh have has your process always been the same or has it evolved over time through those books when it comes to putting together a book um so I think it took a while to hammer out my process um I would say that for my second two for sorry my third and fourth rom-com and Sarah I felt like I'd finally gotten to a rhythm and sort of um, you know, you keep, every time you write a book in a way it gets, some things get a little bit easier, just sort of, um, I mean, you just know yourself a little bit better. You can cheat a little bit, um, or, and so that process was the same for these, for the recent books, but my first two books were very, very different. Um, they're very difficult actually. So when I wrote my first book, I was, I, I was a bit, um, naive. I kind of went from, having not written in a while to trying to write a whole novel. And even though I read a lot of those kinds of novels, I didn't really prepare myself for what I was doing. And I didn't really know what I was doing. And I was really, really lucky that my first agent uh, was, was quite junior. And so um, she had a lot of time to invest in me and did a lot of developmental edits because, um, you know, I don't think I would have gotten uh gotten any further without that kind of handholding, honestly, because, you know, as much creative writing uh, classes or reading that we do, it doesn't always, um, sorry, creative writing classes that you can take, it doesn't always teach you how to build a narrative and how to sort of trust your instincts or hone your instincts to sort of, um, you know, flesh out what's in your head into this, into this journey that people can follow and be invested in. Um, so it was a lot, I don't, I don't even know how many drafts of my first book there were like dozens, dozens probably. And my second book, um, I would say at least, um, at least 10 as well. And like seriously to developmental edits, because, um, it's, it's really, because I was more of a pantser before. And I think I had to learn that if I didn't know where I was going, then I would just get lost and nothing would make sense. So how did you get your first book deal if the book was not complete? Because that is pretty rare. Oh, no, it was. Sorry, it was complete. Um, I had. Oh. so. OK, sorry. Um, basically, what happened is um, I had written my first book. Uh, I think I did two drafts um, of that of, of the matchmakers list, but it was. I sent it out to agents um, much too early in retrospect. I think I needed to sit on it. I needed to really uh, fix it a bit. Um, And then sort of, I I got my agent um, from that. And then she worked on it with me for, for probably six months before she signed me. And then another six months. um, And then it took a while to sell. And so it was, it was, um, it was quite the process. So how much, lengthwise did that first book change from the original manuscript to what we would see at a bookstore it was um so I I knew that for a lot of rom-coms and thrillers and these sorts of books they you know it's about 80,000 words is common maybe sometimes more sometimes less so I, I knew I had that target but um it really sort of got you know bloated up and then down several times as the draft changed at one point 
the matchmakers list was up to 110,000 words and then it was back down to 90 and then up to 100 and then back to 80. So it was really like, there was a lot of editing there. So what are you working on now? Um, so I, so my next book will be mine, uh, will be a rom-com, which is done. That's coming out in, in 2023. And then right now, um, today I was working on my next thriller, um, which I'm not sure when it's coming out. I, it's a very early draft. It's, um, it's unreadable, honestly, at this point, um, but that's, <laughs> I'm working on the next thriller. <laughs> so do you have a schedule for, I'm, I'm assuming you write full time now. I do um, as of the last few months. Yes. So writing full-time, what does your day look like? How do you schedule yourself and commit to writing if this is now your full-time job? Right. So up until recently, because I was working, um, I would just slam my writing into my free time on the weekends and the evenings. And um, having that, uh, I think, really made me a lot more efficient with my time. So that's one thing that I'm working on uh, this year is to try and even though I have more time to really still be disciplined about it um I have a dog now though so my my schedule is not she's a puppy she's like um a little golden doodle thing and um she she needs lots of walks and attention so uh, my time is not always my own but ideally I wake up around seven and my best writing is in the morning so I go straight to my computer and I get as much done as I can before she wakes up and then um and then I try and write in sort of two or three hour chunks as many times, as much of the day as possible. After three hours, it gets difficult. You kind of need a break. So I have to ask, is it because of the success of Are You Sarah that you are now writing full time? Um, it, it's allowed me to write full time for this year. I think that sort of um, in the arts, you never really know what what it's going to be even six right. months from now. So um, I'm trying to think of it as sort of a, as a te- temporarily I'm writing full time, but I want to, I have to, I'll, I'll keep reevaluating it um, over the, over the next years, in the next years. That's exciting yeah. though. Like congratulations. It's a big deal to be able to, to be successful <laughs> enough that you can just write. Oh, thank you. So um, I always ask this, what is the best book that you've read lately that's not your own? The best book that I've read lately, um, I am freezing up at this. Oh, yes, I remember. Um, I am into Tana French's um, Dublin Murder series. Um, I've read the first two, which is called Something Dark Wood and then The Likeness. And then I just bought um, Faithful Place. I think there's six in the book. And I think they made in the BBC series out of the show as well that I'll have to watch now. Um, But it's a detective, um, it's about the detectives in the murder squad in Dublin. And I'm not usually, uh, I don't usually read a lot of detective novels, but it's absolutely beautiful. She's a very literary writer. So it's very atmospheric. It's a great um, setting, great characters. And you sort of really fall in love and like get very invested in these detectives as much as you do with sort of the case that they're solving. What do you typically read if you don't typically read detective novels? Um, I typically read uh, women's fiction, romance, sort of book club uh, fiction. I mean, I go book club fiction is anything, but sort of those, um, you know, like uh, when the crawdad sings or like historical fiction type books and of course thrillers. Okay. I am going to open this up to people if they have questions. Does anyone in the room have a question? Mostly because I'm going to have to figure out how to make this work. Any of you have a question? No questions so far? Okay. Anyone on the virtual side of things, if you have a question, if you want to just put up your hand, I can unmute you and you can ask your question. You usually have questions, so I'd be very surprised if you did not. Oh, one new message. Oh, B says, I just wanted to say that I read two of your other books last year and loved them both. You are amazing. Thank you. (laughs) Um, If you're reading rom-com female fiction, I read a lot of that too. Who do you gravitate towards? Um, 
I think that there is sort of the um, like the, the, the classic ones like like Colleen Hoover and Sophie Kinsella. There's a lot of like perennial authors, but uh, I try and read a lot of sort of the the, the newer authors of, the, of contemporary fiction. I really love um, Uzma Jalaluddin. Uh, she wrote Aisha at Last and uh, Hannah Khan Carries On. Um, they both came out within the last few years and they're set in um, the suburbs of Toronto. And it's kind of similar to mine, like um, you know, South Asian rom-coms and really, really fun and fresh. And um, I really love, um, I'm trying to like Denise Williams. I really love Ali Hazelwood, like those TikTok viral books. They're really, really good. Um, I like a lot of the contemporary ones and I want to read Bridgerton. I've watched the shows, but I haven't read, I haven't read the books yet. <laughs> I have read the first two. They are a quick read. I can tell you that. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh my God. My question just went in my head and out. Okay. In my head and out. My brains are completely fresh. Oh, I was going to ask you about reading, reading thrillers and writing thrillers because it can feel like sometimes when you read them that they have similar plot lines. And yeah. that you've read one thriller and you're like, mm, I can figure out where this is going. Do you avoid reading thrillers when you are writing thrillers or rom-coms when you are writing rom-coms? Um, actually, it's the opposite. I try and read more while I'm writing it because I find that, um, and I don't try and like, it doesn't, I don't try and make it like homework or something. When I'm reading for pleasure, I try and even subconsciously just sort of think about what I'm enjoying about a book and what I'm not and sort of what techniques the author is doing or, you know, how did they deal with that sort of situation? How did they cover the passage of time? Like um, just sort of like craft techniques or even um, just, just different things, anything that like, and so when I'm enjoying something or I'm not enjoying something, I really try and stop and think, okay, why though? And then try and think about, can that be applied to my, own writing or a tricky situation or concept that I'm dealing with. So, um, and I do find that reading a lot of like really, really good thrillers um, helps me, helps me get my mojo. Like it inspires me to, to be creative and to think of, you know, oh, that was really clever how they did that. You know, like it makes me want to be clever and, 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 and it makes me work harder. You mentioned TikTok, viral books. Book talk is a thing. Bookstagram yeah. is a thing. How has that changed how you and other authors, I imagine you speak with other authors, how you promote your books and how you, how you market those books in a way that you probably wouldn't have even five years ago? Um, it's really changed. Honestly, I haven't kept up with it. I'm not, I'm, I think I'm on TikTok. I think I've posted one of my dog um, and, I, and I watch a lot of food videos, um, like how to make stuff, but um, I didn't keep up. And I think that the authors that did and really sort of had sort of this natural grasp um, it, it's really served them well because um, I, you know, I saw an article, I forget which newspaper, like that, you know, Gen Z is driving, is deciding which books are at the bestseller list, like Colleen Hoover, who I was telling you about, and, and Allie Hazelwood, like, like they are getting people interested in reading again, uh, or more, and, it, and I think that's great, it doesn't matter what you read. Um, I don't think it's changed anything for me majorly. I do try, like I post reels when I can instead of like grid pictures. Yeah. Um, I tr like I try not to be, it doesn't feel authentic to me. And so, and I just, I just want to be authentic and say like, if I'm excited about something or I see something cool, I post it. Um, and if I become more comfortable and it feels more like me, then I'll keep going with it. But it just didn't, I just didn't really know how to navigate that and didn't. So I decided not to sort of keep up with the trend. Um, but it, yes, it definitely has changed. I think a lot of ways that, 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 you know, publishers sort of um, market their books and, and how everything works. Yeah. What advice would you have for someone who is mulling a book over in their head and has never, has never, one, never written it down, or two, maybe has written something and wants to get into publishing. I know there's a lot of self-publishing opportunities now, but you had a book deal, you have a book deal. Uh, what advice would you have for them in terms of making it past that big hurdle? For, for getting traditionally published? Yeah. Um, so I would say that, like, first is, like, think about what your, your goals are. Um, for it, it's sort of like, is it, 
like, do you have a book idea? And is it your goal to sort of write this book and get it out into the world and write as widely as possible? Or is your goal to, to be, you know, a, to be a writer? And, the, and this idea is just the beginning that you're going to be, because once you write your first book, um, if this is going to be your career, okay, you have to have another idea. You have to immediately start writing your next book and start thinking about your next book. So um, I think that those, you, sort of figuring out where you stand on that can help you sort of go forward because then, you know, whether you want to be self-published or you want to go to the traditionally published, it, it might be more transparent about like how, like how you want to proceed. Um, the other thing is um, don't give up and don't, and try your best. I mean, I didn't follow this advice at all, but try not to worry <laughs> about um, things that you can't control. Because I mean, if you've, yeah, you've written a book and you're submitting it to agents or you're submitting it directly to publishers, you can't control how long it's going to take someone to read your email or what they're going to think or how long that process is going to take because it is long. It even was long for someone, for, for me, which actually it didn't really, it actually wasn't that long. So I think, um, so when you're going through that process is just focus on what you can control and what you can control is your own writing. And so keep writing, um, do everything you can to make yourself a better writer you know, don't let anything go. If you have a gut instinct that something isn't working, um, you know, it's always right. Just, just, just figure it out, you know, get a critique buddy, you know, join an online writing class. Um, there's lots of free things online or master classes or resources that, that I've used and um, can share. So um, just, just focus on that and, and really enjoy, enjoy the process. Um, because if you're not writing because you enjoy it, then how did you make yourself a better writer? Um, I read a lot. Um, I think that uh, just, especially because during, um, during law school, those three years, I did not read a single novel. Like I don't, I, it, you know, the, the big novels that came out in those three years, I couldn't even name them. Right. Like I, I, I completely went off the grid. And so I think I had a lot of catching up to do and just sort of to get myself back in the flow. I guess um, I did a, did writing courses. I um, I did have people in my life that I like shared the book early drafts with and asked for their feedback. Um, and um, I always followed critiques, like like criticism or um, or feedback. I think. Um, if someone has taken the time to read your work and they are offering you a way to make it better, I mean, I mean, there's some feedback that just doesn't resonate because maybe they misunderstood what you were doing or their things are so left field. I'm not saying that you have to listen to all feedback, but if there is something genuine that there's something wiggling in your head that says, okay, actually this may be, there may be a truth to it, like what they're saying could actually help me. But then a lot of times, and myself included, we resist that feedback because it would be very, very hard and complicated and grueling to address that feedback and to fix it because it because that thread could unravel your whole project. But if there's something wiggling, it's worth considering because that's how you make yourself better. Do you have one story of a time where it just didn't go the way you think you were, you, it, it wasn't going the way you thought it was going to go. And can you just tell us about how things kind of work themselves out with writing? And when you talked about, you say, don't give up and just keep going. Can you give us an example of how that kind of played out for you? Um, like, is it character development or, or where do you, where do you typically do you mean, run into a wall? Um, where do I typically run into? I'm trying to think. So that, so most of that happened um, with, with the matchmakers list. That was my first rom-com. And I think um, what I didn't understand is something that I've really tried hard to work on now before I start writing a book outline is like, what is the story really about? Um, like at the center of it, not like, not what, not like what's the plot, but like, what are, what is the core message? Like what's the feeling? Um, and I could not, describe that for the matchmakers list in some ways it was like I was trying to be literary you know like a lot of the literary writers that I was that I admired in some ways I was trying to be um 
like like straight up romance and banter and 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 light and in other ways I was trying to be to like harpoon my views of about social justice in there right like it, it was all over the place and so you know uh, someone asked like my from agent she said okay is it the book about this or is the book about this or is the book about this and I had to decide because um once I decided I basically had to scrap all of this or if not scrap it really tone it down and kind of weave it into the central thing that I was doing so that was very very hard and that's why it took me why we did so many development developmental, developmental edits is because I kept changing directions and I didn't even realize I was doing that. And that has obviously made your, like the future books you wrote easier. It did. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I hope so. Not the second one. The second one was still hard, but, but after a while it clicked and it, it's been easier since. All right. Um, uh... I can't believe nobody has questions. This is the quietest group I've ever had. Either I'm asking all the questions they have or, <laughs> oh, okay. Did you want to come look at the camera? Okay. We have a question from the audience. So when did you, like, how far did you write it? Have, uh, on the she, he would like to know how far into your writing outline for Are You Sarah did you have the Tommy twist originally? Um, he, he would like yes. to know did you originally have it planned or is that something that developed as the writing happened no I had that planned um because um that I concept came early to me I'm not even sure just sort of I, I can't remember how I came up with it it just sort of landed in my brain um but then I think it stuck with me because I like the idea of this um of this Nathan guy, sorry, I don't, I, I can spoil her. I forgot. Um, I, I, I like, <laughs> I can, I'm going to spoil. I like the idea that there is this character, Nathan, who's like kind of on the sidelines who Ellis just totally ignores and is not really, is sort of like a non-issue for her. And, but he's actually sort of stalking her and the power that, that these people can have in our lives. And um, the, t the, the twist I, I did, I did have from the beginning. Um, I don't think that always works for for uh, for everyone. I mean, I saw like I was on a um, Lisa Unger, for example, was talking about how she writes, and you know she's like a god of of crime fiction, and she's a pantser. And I was surprised because you know I was just reading one of her books, Confessions on the Seven for Five, and I'm like I had no, like I couldn't have pants this. Like it's um, it's it's incredible, and there are some people who can just come up with twist as they go but for me I need to know where I'm going he says thank you <laughs> oh thanks for asking <laughs> any other questions no question okay I have one last question and I don't know if you're actually going to answer it but what can you tell us about the next thriller um, about where you started anyways what's your basic premise okay so um I will say this, that, um, you know, as you can tell from Sarah, I think that I have a lot of opinions about the world. Um, I, you know, especially this, uh, the dark times that we find it ourselves in and the injustice of a lot of, a lot of things about the world that we don't even question. And so um, with that same framework, um, the setting is going to be at a destination, a lavish, over the top, ridiculously obscene, a destination wedding in Mexico, um, a South Asian wedding. And, you know, there's a lot of um, cultural norms that have led to a lot of excess and in the, in this industry that I have opinions about as well. And um, so, <laughs> so the setting will be obviously murder at a destination South Asian wedding. Oh, well, I very much look forward to it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the book. And the other books and we will watch for your next one coming out next year thank you so much for having me i really it was really nice